In his book titled, Can Man Live Without God? Rabbi Zacharias tells of the time when he went to Poland and he visited the Nazi death camps uh, at Auschwitz and Birkenau and he says that it was an experience that dramatically changed his life. He says that many times since his first visit there he has reflected in silence on the words which hung above one of those gas chambers Hitler envisioned a whole generation of young people who, could, who, who would not have a conscience. Uh, and Hitler's statement was posted there above that gas chamber to forever remind visitors of the hell that was unleashed as Hitler's goal was realized during World War II. Here are Hitler's words posted on the wall at Auschwitz, and I got a, a, a video, or not a video, but a, a, a picture of, of that uh, uh, to show you, Hitler's words posted on this wall in Auschwitz say, I freed Germany from the stupid and degrading fallacies of conscience and morality. He says, we will train young people before whom the world will tremble. I want young people capable of violence, imperious, relentless, and cruel. And it is believed that Hitler spoke these words in a speech at a youth rally in Nuremberg. Now also on display at the Auschwitz concentration camp, which is now a Holocaust museum, are thousands of pounds of women's hair retrieved and marketed as a commodity by the Nazi exterminators who sent up to 12,000 people a day to the gas ovens. Now you can't help but wonder how a people, how a nation could get to this point of such viciousness and brutality. Germany at the time was considered to be one of the most educated nations on the earth. It was influential in developing the principles and the culture of the Enlightenment. How can this happen that people could treat one another this way? <coughs> Viktor Frankl, a, survival of Aus a survivor of Auschwitz, answers with this. He says, if we present man with a concept of man which is not true, we may well corrupt him. He goes on to say, when we present him as an automation of reflexes, as a mind machine, as a bundle of instincts, as a pawn of drive and reactions, as a mere product of heredity and environment, we feed the nihilism, in other words, the meaninglessness to which modern man is, in any case, prone. He says, I became acquainted with the last stage of corruption in my second concentration camp, Auschwitz. The gas chambers of Auschwitz were ultimately the consequence of the theory that man is nothing but the product of heredity environment, or as the Nazis like to say, of blood and soil. He says, I am absolutely convinced that the gas chambers of Auschwitz, Treblinka, and Medanic were ultimately prepared not in some government ministry in Berlin, but rather at the desks in lecture halls of nihilistic scientists and philosophers. In other words, Viktor Frankl understood clearly the atrocities of Nazi Germany, that they did not arise out of some governmental military strategy, but out of the anti-God philosophies and the materialistic assumptions that were promoted by the educated elite who taught that God is dead. If man is going to live without God, there is no moral, objective moral underpinning to determine what is right and what is wrong. And if man is not recognized as made in God's image, the sacredness of life disappears. I, I think that that is why Hitler and his followers could in good conscience exterminate six million Jewish people and start a war that sucked in the whole world and killed even millions more. Now some will challenge me. They'll say, preacher, you can't say that just because someone doesn't believe in God that they're going to be violent against all of humanity and behave badly. You know, they're going, to, they're going to say, I know many atheists who don't believe in God and yet they're good people. And I would respond by saying, don't misunderstand me. I'm not saying that all unbelievers and all atheists endorse violence and mistreat others. I, too, know of people who deny God's existence, and yet they still love their family, and they work hard, and they contribute towards the good of our community. But what I am saying is that the person who adopts an anti-God worldview has no objective 
moral standard because atheism doesn't recognize a moral standard outside of oneself. And if morality is an individual decision, then who am I to say that what you're doing is wrong? And vice versa. As our American culture becomes more and more removed from recognizing the existence of God and more removed from submitting to biblical standards like the Ten Commandments and Jesus' Sermon on the Mount, I'm hearing things more often like, who are you to tell me what's right or wrong? Or, you know, what's right or wrong for you might not be right or wrong for me. And today, uh, in the message, we are asking a tough question as we consider this God's Not Dead series. Don't I get to decide what's right or wrong? And I would respond by saying that morality points to the character of God for six reasons. First of all, we are made in God's image. That's what Genesis chapter 1, verses 26 through 31 tells us. Then God said, let us make man in our image, in our likeness, and let them rule over the fish of the sea and the birds of the air, over the livestock, over all the earth, and over all the creatures that move along the ground. So God created man in his own image. And it is this fact that we are made in God's image that makes life so sacred and precious. That's why it's wrong to murder babies even if they're not born yet. This is why we take care of the weak and why we take care of the sick and those who are in need. This is why we don't or we shouldn't euthanize the elderly. This is why we care for the mentally and the physically challenged you see, they are all made in God's image. Where does our sense of justice and injustice come from? It comes from the character of God in whose image we are made. When the founding fathers of our country were penning the words of the Declaration of Independence, they recognized that all individuals have unalienable rights that come from our Creator God. And they wrote, we hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, that among those are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. They recognized that we are connected with God. Shouldn't we? Another reason why I don't get to decide what's right and wrong is because God is the creator of righteousness and wholeness. Goodness emanates out of his character. In recent years, there's been a big push to remove all things Christian from the public square. And we are living under the illusion that it's possible to be neutral about morality, that one moral standard shouldn't and can't be pushed over another. Of course, the irony of this movement is that atheism's morality, that there is no morality, or that morality is determined by the majority of people, that's now being pushed over biblical moral principles. And so over past recent years, we've read in the news of atheistic groups who've brought lawsuits against courthouses and schools and parks for having displays of the Ten Commandments. They are being removed from the public square, but is that a good thing? I, I'm just not sure that I see what's bad about the Ten Commandments. I'm not sure that I think it's a bad thing for people to be reminded of what's right and what's wrong by seeing it posted in the public square and supported by society. Maybe it's because the principles of morality as espoused by the Ten Commandments have stopped being supported by our culture, which explains why 50 years ago the worst thing to happen in our schools was gum being stuck underneath the desks. But today, it's students shooting up the schools and beating up their teachers. Turn in your Bible, if you've got it with you, to Exodus chapter 20. And it records the Ten Commandments. Exodus chapter 20, and I want us to review those right now. Here are the Ten Commandments. Number one, you shall have no other gods before me. Number two, you shall not make for yourself an idol. Number three, do not misuse the name of your God. And number four, remember to keep the Sabbath day holy. These first four commandments center on the realization that God is to be first in our life. That we are to live and breathe and talk and work out of a centeredness that is founded on him. And when that's true for a person, I can tell you that life 
gets better. And it gets better for the people around you. We start to think and see things like God thinks and sees things. And the first four commandments focus on our relationship with God. Now the next six commandments, they focus on our relationships with other people. So number five is honor your father and your mother. Six, you shall not murder. Seven, do not commit adultery. Number eight, you shall not steal. Number nine, do not give false testimony against your neighbor. In other words, we are to live with honesty and integrity. And, and then commandment number ten, do not covet. That means to live with a sense of contentedness so that you are not just wrapped up in materialistic kinds of things, constantly wishing that you had what everyone else does and seeking to get it at whatever cost. The laws of our land were originally founded on principles right out of God's word, right out of the Bible. Why do these principles resonate as truth to us? Because they come out of the very character and thoughts of God in whose image we are made. This concern for right and wrong, for justice and injustice, it's innate within us because it was planted there by the God who made us. A third reason why I don't get to decide what's right or wrong is we cannot know what is wrong if we do not know what is right. The renowned Russian novelist Fyodor Dostoevsky said, Without God, all things are possible. Without God, all things are permissible. His writings touch on the horrible consequences and the hardships of living in a godless society, noting that, quote, if everyone were actively Christian, not a single social question would come up. As Christians, they would settle everything, unquote. Later on, after, after Dostoevsky, Joseph Stalin, the cruel Soviet dictator who murdered 15 million of his own people, decisively broke from a belief in God. In fact, Stalin saw humans as no higher than the level of animals who were in his way as he sought to build a world without God. In the Bible's Old Testament book of Judges, we read that the Israelites were constantly in a vicious circle and in a cycle in which they would at first be close to God, but then they would forget about God's law. And they would just kind of let things slide and finally they would get to a point where they forgot all about God entirely. And they would just kind of implode in this chaos of greed and immorality and corruption because as we read at the end of the book, Judges chapter 21 verse 25, everyone did as he saw fit. Everyone did as he saw fit. Living without God led to chaos and disunity, and it opened them up to attacks by their enemies, which is what happened over and over again. It is not good when everybody is a law unto, them own, unto their own selves, where everyone does just as he or she sees fit. And Jesus really, he set the record straight in, in his Sermon on the Mount, which we can read in Matthew chapters 5 through 7. In his message, Jesus addresses a Pharisaic mindset that seeks to look good on the outside, but it really isn't because their hearts are far from God. And so Jesus, for instance, he addresses hatred for the immorality that it really is. People tend to dismiss that as not all that bad, right? At least they're not killing somebody. But Jesus says, no, this is to misunderstand what is right in God's eyes. It's not okay to live in constant anger, to live in constant discord towards the people around you, and that matters to God. He addresses lust, calling it the sin that it is. People tend to dismiss lust as not all that bad, and so pornography and prostitution and trafficking and sex outside of marriage, they are proliferating in our communities and in our culture. And people say, hey, as long as two people are consenting to be together with one another, what's wrong with that? But I'm telling you, the stuff that broke out in the news this past week with the Ingham County prosecutor, that didn't just happen in a vacuum. There were patterns and there were behaviors and habits building up over a lifetime that led to what was finally revealed in the news. The lust and the profanity and the promiscuity that our culture is becoming more and more accepting of fed into this whole prostitution ring that the county prosecutor was mixed up with. Lust easily leads 
to immoral actions. Doing what's right by God's standards, as outlined in the Bible, is what brings health and wholeness to our lives. So our cues for morality, they must come from God. But if we're not careful, we can ignore it if we choose to do so. You know, the scripture refers to this as having a hardened heart or a seared conscience. And when a heart is hardened against God, a person is unwilling to submit their life to his way of doing things. It has all all to do with our relationship with God and our relationship with one another. And it's not just unbelievers who can have seared hearts. Christians can have seared hearts if we're careless. And so in 1 Timothy chapter 4, verses 1 and 2, we read, The Spirit clearly says that in later times some will abandon the faith and follow deceiving spirits and things taught by demons. Such teachings come through hypocritical liars whose consciences have been seared as with a hot iron. And so Paul, he gives us this picture, right, uh, of a person's conscience as one time it was alive and it was vibrant and it was working in cooperation with God's leading. But then this person's conscience becomes hardened and calloused. It doesn't feel God's prodding and leading anymore, right? Because its sensitivity to the Holy Spirit has been deadened. Now you've probably experienced this in the past. No doubt you've experienced this in the past. Maybe as a child it was in connection with disobeying your parent, which you knew was wrong. I mean, you're told not to eat snacks before supper time, right? But you do. And the first time you do that, your conscience is pricked and you feel bad, but then you do it again the next day anyway. And as time goes on, it becomes easier and easier to do it, right? you eventually stop feeling guilty about it altogether. That's your conscience being seared. Now as we get older, perhaps those sins get a little more serious. Maybe it involves cheating on a test. And the first time you sneak answers from the guy sitting next to you, you feel bad about it and you vow to never do it again. You're going to study harder the next time, right? But somehow it just gets a little bit easier to steal those answers the next time. And you don't feel so bad unless you get caught. That's your conscience being seared. Or maybe it has to do with your taxes. You know, we're in tax season right now, and maybe it all started years ago when you didn't declare certain undocumented income uh, on your tax report, and on your income tax report. Or maybe, maybe you, you padded your expenses, right, so that you could deduct more from the taxes you had to pay. Now, at first, you feel guilty about that. You see it as stealing from the government from whom you, know, you benefit by roads to drive on and Medicaid and a strong military that keeps you secure. But now, after years of such stealing, you no longer even feel bad about such dishonesty. In fact, you now rationalize the government owes you. They should be paying you because you're a good, hard-working citizen, right? That's your conscience being seared. And we could go on and on with this. Your employer, you know, embezzling from your employer, or stealing time by being on Facebook and scrolling through the internet when you should be working, or taking supplies home. That's your conscience being seared. What concerns me about our American culture today is that we're losing our sense of moral boundaries. We're not as united in our understanding of of morals and ethics as we used to be when most Americans at least recognized the goodness and value of the Bible's moral principles. But what happens when morality to God and and God goes away? What happens to our morality when he just kind of leaves the picture? We're seeing more and more of it. Right becomes wrong. Wrong becomes right. Right. People live with hopelessness and despair. People become a law unto themselves. For example, you can blame all the incessant mass shootings at schools and military installations and colleges and and, and malls. You can blame those mass shootings on a lack of gun control if you really want to. But I'm telling you, you will never find the solution to such atrocities until people find their center and purpose in Jesus Christ. It is a delicate balance, this conscience thing. Jiminy Cricket, you remember Jiminy Cricket in Disney's Pinocchio? He always sang, 
always let your conscience be your guide, right? And give a little whistle. You know, that kind of thing. That can be a good thing. If your conscience is constantly nurtured and informed by the right guidance and information, the question is, who will that be for you? Will it be just you? Will it be your parents? Will it be your friends? Will it be the TV shows you watch or the songs that you sing? Will it be the person that you're in love with? Will it be the politicians and the courts? Who will be your guide? Who, who will inform your conscience? I would encourage you to let God be the one to inform your conscience and the message that's contained in the Bible. You can't go wrong when you cooperate with God. And nothing feels better than knowing you are doing the right thing, even if nobody else is. But here's the thing. If you do go wrong, God provided a way to remove what was wrong with us. I love the story Rice Brooks tells in his book, God's Not Dead. About the time when he was on an airplane and the man sitting in the seat next to Brooks, he, he told him that he was an atheist because he felt that the existence of evil meant that a good God couldn't exist. And uh, so Brooks says to him, he says, you know, God could remove all the evil in the world in an instant. All he has to do is kill every person and evil would stop. <laughs> well, aren't you glad that God didn't decide to deal with the problem of our sin in that way? In John chapter 3, verses 16 and 17, we read that God so loved the world, he gave his one and only son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. So God's plan for removing evil from our world was to come down into our world and extract that evil from our heart in such a way that we could then go on and live for God. And as we submit our lives and our minds to Jesus, you know, we are able to do that. Jesus fought for us on the cross when he became the sacrifice that brings us the forgiveness of sins. The Holy Spirit fights for us now as he helps us to see our world from God's perspective. Romans 12, 2, it says, Do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will know and be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. You see, God's plan is to remove evil from our world one person at a time. God removes that darkness from our hearts and he restores life back to its fullness and its morality. We all say we want evil from the world to vanish, right? But the question is, are we willing to submit our evil to God's will? And when it comes to the question, don't I get to decide what's right or wrong? The ultimate answer ties in with the fact, one more observation, that evil will be judged and punished one day. When Christ comes back in his fullness, what you or I think is right or wrong, it's not going to make a bit of difference. What matters is what God thinks is right or wrong. According to the Bible, at the point of final judgment, God will remove all the evil from the world. People today love to quote Jesus' words from Matthew 7, 1. Do not judge or you will be judged. Often that's quoted to distract you from addressing some problem or issue in their life, right? And we do have to be careful of being judgmental. But let's never forget that one day Jesus will judge us in accordance with our faith in his salvation. Acts chapter 17, verse 31. It says, For God has set a day when he will judge the world with justice by the man he has appointed. And he has given us proof to all the people by raising him from the dead. So how we behave today ought to be tempered in light of God's judgment one day in the future. In his book, Prepare to Answer, Rubel Shelley tells the story of uh, how, how January 13th, 1982, there was a terrible tragedy that occurred in our nation's capital. And I remember that tragedy because I was a sophomore in college. Air Florida's Flight 90 crashed shortly after takeoff from Washington's National Airport. Failing to gain the necessary altitude, the big jet clipped a bridge and, oh, that was going over the Potomac River and, and, it, and it killed a number of people on the bridge and then it fell into the water killing a number of other people. And 
But there was a bright spot amidst this tragedy that testifies to the fact that humans are made and created by a personal God who instills within us a sense of right and wrong, a sense of what's good and bad. In the rescue effort following that crash of Flight 90, there were six survivors clinging to the plane's floating tail section in the river. And there was a park police helicopter that was lowering a lifeline and a flotation ring. And each time that they lowered that, there was a man down in the water who was later identified as Arlen D. Williams, Jr. He would pass the life ring on to someone else. He was described by the rescue team as alert and in control. He was willing to risk being in those icy waters longer for the sake of allowing someone else to be saved before him. When the lifeline and flotation ring had been passed by all the others and they were safe and sound on the shore, uh, the helicopter team went back to pick up this brave man and bring him back to safety. But when they reached the scene, he was gone. The cold water had taken its final casualty that day. What he did was deliberate and kind. He sacrificially put others ahead of himself so that they could be saved. Why do human beings do such things? Where does the capacity to do something like that come from? If we are simply creatures of nature, just seeking to survive by being the fittest, do you think it would be possible for someone to be so selfless? The heroic man in the freezing waters proves that we are more than creatures of nature. We are God's creatures. We are made in his image. Nature makes no distinctions between good and evil, right or wrong, but we humans do. Nature at its best is atoms and molecules and tissue. Humanity at its best is compassionate and selfless and loving. There is something in men and women that is higher and greater than anything that nature can produce on its own. Now, like mere animals, we also have instinctive drives. But unlike mere animals, we also have a moral capacity to judge and to restrain or even overrule our instincts for the sake of some higher duty that we sense, for the sake of doing what's right. And that's why when it comes to answering the question of who gets to decide what's right or wrong, it's not you. It's not me. Romans 3.10 tells us that no one is righteous. So how can we even begin to make a determination about that? But Philippians 1.27 says, Whatever happens, conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. Our morality comes from Him. Our morality comes from God. And we must cooperate with Him if we want the abundant life that we read of in the New Testament. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we love you and we thank you for your word that is a, a constant guide. It, it truly is a light unto our path, a, a light unto our feet. And as long as we stay within your light, we know that uh, we can do things that are, are good and add value to other people's lives. We know that when we are in connection with you, uh, that our character will come to reflect that of Christ. And so we just pray, Lord, that you would help us to be conscious of that, that you would help us to uh, study your word with integrity and intensity, because it is a guide for what is right and what is wrong. Be with us now as we leave here. May we go forth with your favor and blessing. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.